Hello, this is your lecture on muscles. Um, a few things before I get started with the lecture. Number one, there is no PowerPoint presentation that's associated with this particular chapter. Number two, the information that you will need to make sure that you are very familiar with will come from the study sheet as well as any other worksheets that are posted within Blackboard for this chapter. And um, the connect assignments that you will be completing as for as far as for this chapter so just make sure that you have all that information and you're studying from whatever I discuss in this this lecture as well as the guides and the resources that I just indicated okay to get right with it let's go ahead and begin our study of myology myology is the study of muscles and in this section, we are going to go over a variety of muscles, and we're going to group them according to uh, their functions or their actions or where they're located. In the textbook, it actually has tables that list all of the different types of muscles. Um, I believe one table is the muscles of facial expression. There's another table that's the muscles that move the head and neck, the muscles of the abdominal wall, so on and so forth. Those are very good references, those tables, for you to look to as far as what the muscle actually does, in addition to the study sheet that I have provided for you, as well as the worksheet that indicates some additional information and the grouping of muscles. That's going to be very important. Okay, so to get started, <clears throat> there are a variety of ways that we actually name muscles. And I have listed eight that we typically focus on as far as how muscles are named. So I have them listed here. They're also listed on the study sheet as well as the worksheet that has been posted. But just to give you an idea, if you are not familiar, myology, the study of muscles. Muscles are named according to their size, their location, Action, shape, origin and insertion, divisions of attachment or number of heads, and superficial or deep, and direction of fibers. Okay, on the worksheet that has been provided, I provide you with examples of all of those, but I'll just touch on them very briefly here. Size. A muscle that's named according to its size is gluteus maximus. If there's a maximus, there's also a minimus somewhere, so there is a gluteus minimus. But that's giving you an idea that that is a very large muscle. In fact, gluteus maximus is the largest muscle in the body. Location. Location would be an example, we could say temporalis. And since we just came off of studying the skeletal system, we know that there is a temporal bone. So temporalis is located over the temporal bone, just as frontalis is located over the frontal bone. Action. Some muscles will tell you exactly what they do. For example, depressor labi inferioris. Depressor means to press down. Labi actually means lip. And inferioris means toward the foot. So it's literally telling you what it will do and what it will move. Um, another example of one that's named according to its action is levator palpebrae superioris. Even if you don't know what all those words mean, levator means to like levitate, to raise. Uh, palpebra actually means eye or around the eye or eyelid and superioris means toward the head. So levator palpebrae superioris actually raises the eyelid toward the head. Shape, uh, deltoid is shaped like a delta. Uh, trapezius is shaped like a trapezoid, but they are named according to their shape. Origin and insertion. This one requires a little bit more of an explanation because the origin is the permanent immovable portion of a muscle. The insertion is the movable portion of the muscle. And those two muscles can actually be held together by what is called an aponeurosis. Now that term should be relatively familiar since we introduced it in the skeletal system. So an example of a muscle that would be named according to its origin and insertion would be occipitofrontalis. The first part, portion of the word is telling you the origin. The second portion of the word is telling you the insertion. So occipitofrontalis begins at the occipital bone. There's an aponeurosis between that muscle and the next muscle, which is frontalis, and the insertion is at frontalis. So occipitalis is the immovable portion, while if we raise our eyebrows, we can actually see frontalis moving. So origin and insertion, 
occipital frontalis. Another example would be sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid is one of those muscles that we use as an anatomical structure and reference to locate the common carotid arteries. And I'm going to turn my head and you'll actually be able to see that muscle because in addition to that, it creates the widest part of the neck. So if I turn here, you see a muscle that starts right here at about the sternum. It crosses over my clavicle, sternocleido, and then it inserts at the mastoid process of the temporal bone. So you can kind of see it. I just want to make sure you can see it with my hair in the way. This is it right there, sternocleidomastoid, anatomical structure that helps us locate the common carotid arteries. Divisions of attachment or the numbers of head for heads. For example, biceps brachii, which most of us know where biceps are. Biceps, two divisions of att attachment. Triceps, if I turn this way, you can kind of see it. There it is. Triceps has three divisions of attachment. Whether they are superficial or deep, superficial meaning closer to the surface, while deep means further away from the surface. So external oblique would be closer to the surface, <coughs> excuse me, while internal oblique would be further away from the surface. And then the direction of fibers. Um, if the fiber, I can use external oblique again because while external is telling you that it's superficial, oblique is telling you that it's a diagonal striation in that muscle. Or we could use transverse abdominis, where transverse is telling you that the fibers are horizontal and abdominis is telling you its location is located on the abdomen. Okay. If you look on the study sheet, that's pretty much the information that is indicated in that first paragraph. Now I know it does say that the quiz will not have any diagrams, that is accurate. And um, it's also talking about other information that is not specific to your class. Uh, it begins to talk about uh, what will be, no diagrams, uh, what will start after the dotted line. It's important that you know all of the information in regard to muscles from what I just started all the way through the end. Okay, also goes over helpful hints and it moves right into the muscles of the head and neck. So if you're looking in the textbook and you're looking at the tables, you will note that under muscles of the head and neck, there may be many. However, we're only, we will only identify those that you have listed on your worksheet and in the study sheet. Now, before I get to muscles that move the head and neck, I need to go over the muscles of facial expression first. So I'm going to go back very briefly to access another one of the study sheets. just to see if I can find some information. If my dog barks, please excuse her. Because I believe she's getting ready to bark. Hmm. As I look through this study sheet, I do not see the muscles that move that of facial expression. So the muscles of facial expression are actually only on the worksheet. So make sure that you take the time to access that. And I'm going to pause here just for a moment, just so that I can access that sheet and I'll be right back so that I can make sure I don't exclude any. Okay, I found the sheet. And I need to make a correction on something. You actually will have one diagram that you will be responsible for identifying the muscles on, and it's only on the muscles of facial expression. So if you're looking at your worksheet, you will notice on the second page, there are a total of three, six, seven, seven muscles of facial expression, and I give you some general information about each one of those that diagram will be on your quiz. And I will post that particular diagram for you to access. I believe on the study sheet that there is a diagram of the muscles of facial expression. I'm just checking that now. No, there's not. Well, 
I will make sure that you have a posted diagram of the muscles of facial expression that you will see on your quiz so that you will be ready for that. Okay, so going over the muscles of facial expression, you have all of them listed. I'm looking directly at it. Epicranius, named according to its location, occipital frontalis, which I talked to you a bit before, and it gives you a bit of information about each one. You are responsible for knowing those muscles of facial expression and the general information that I give in regard to those. For example, a zygomaticus major is referred to as the laughing muscle. Anytime you see a muscle that has a major, there's a minor somewhere. Give me just one second so I can make sure I have some other information accurate. Okay, so to pick up where I left off, <clears throat> epicranius occipital frontalis, I've explained that one, orbicularis oculi and orbicularis oris. Uh, orbicularis oculi obviously encircles the eye and orbicularis oris encircles the oral cavity. But one, one of the most important things about these two muscles, or three, since we have two eyes, is that they are called sphincter muscles. Sphincter muscles are round muscles that typically will enclose or encircle a, a cavity of some sort. Oftentimes when they are contracted, they are designed to keep something in or keep something closed. So if you can visualize orbicularis oris that's around the mouth. When your mouth is closed, it assists in closing the mouth. It's not the only muscle that helps to close the mouth, but it is one that will assist. And the same thing with orbicularis um, oculi for the eyes. There are other muscular sphincters that we have, such as the anal sphincter, the esophageal sphincter, and they actually help to regulate when uh, material will pass from one organ into the other. For example, the es esophageal sphincter is responsible for regulating when food passes from your esophagus into your stomach. So when they're contracted, they help to regulate. Okay, in addition, to, in addition to that, we also have buccinator, which is located in the soft area of the cheek, sometimes referred to as the trumpeter's muscle. Zygomaticus major, as I indicated, is referred to as the laughing muscle. It's the muscle that when you smile a lot or when you laugh for a long time, oftentimes your cheek will begin to hurt. That's because it inserts at the corners of the mouth to help to pull the corners of the mouth superiorly. And when it's contracted for a long time, it begins to ache. Zygomaticus minor, the job of minor muscles is to assist the major. So that's what its primary job is. And then finally, you have platysma, which is the broad, flat muscle of the neck. If I turn my head to the side, you can see sternocleidomastoid. But what you can't really see, and if I do like this, you can kind of see it right here. It's a broad, flat muscle of the neck. And it literally spans from about to our chin all the way down to our clavicle. All right, so those are the muscles of facial expression. Make sure that you uh, review those and you know the various uh, other names, the also known as names that they may have and their functions. If you look below the dotted line, you will note that it says, please make sure that you have the subtle that you study the muscle groupings as they are listed below. It will be important to know any specific information regarding the muscles as well as the group that they belong to. So I would suggest when studying these muscles, maybe make some note cards. And in making the note cards, have them headed according to the muscle group. For example, the muscles of mastication. Mastication means to chew. I believe in your textbook, it actually has four muscles in that table. It's either four or five, but there are only two that you're responsible for knowing. The first one is temporalis. Temporalis is named according to its location, as I indicated, and it's a fan-shaped muscle that's located right here over that particular bone. It is the strongest of the two muscles of mastication. The other muscle of mastication is masseter. Masseter is located at the angle of the jaw, and when contracted, it helps to keep our mouths closed. It's a quadrilateral muscle, meaning that it has four sides to it, and it's a very strong muscle. But the strongest of the muscles of mastication that we are identifying is temporalis. Okay, next, and this is where I was picking up on the study sheet, are the muscles that move the head and vertebral column. There's only one that you need to know, and that's sternocleidomastoid, creating the widest part of the neck, used as the anatomical guide or anatomical structure that we help 
to locate the common carotid arteries. And when it's contracted, it helps to pull our heads to the side. That's this muscle that you see with its origin at the sternum, the insertion at the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Muscles that move the pectoral girdle, you're only responsible for knowing three. Uh, trapezius is named based upon its shape. Levator scapulae is telling you exactly what it does. It raises the scapula. And pectoralis minor. You'll notice that pectoralis major is not a part of this grouping, but pectoralis minor will assist the major muscle, which is actually one of the muscles that is in the next grouping to help to move the arm. Now, when we're talking about moving the arm, I'm speaking in regard to moving the entire arm, not the forearm and not the hand, the entire arm as it is. So if you would look at the muscle groupings of the muscles that are responsible for moving the arm, we have a few more of them. We have caracobrachialis. This one is named according to anatomical structures that are on the scapula. You just need to know that that particular muscle is one of the muscles in that group that help to move the arm. Pectoralis major. Pectoralis major is the broad, flat muscle of the chest, and it allows us to adduct which means to bring toward the body, the arm. If you were actually to do this action, you can feel that muscle contract. Latissimus dorsi. Latissimus dorsi is actually located on our back. Thus the word dorsi. When we actually studied the dorsal cavity way back in chapter one, we were talking about a cavity or the cavities that we could see from the back. So latissimus dorsi is a very large muscle and I believe that you have a picture of it. Yes, there's a picture of latissimus dorsi on your study sheet. And it's showing trapezius, but Trapezius is also, it's kind of also showing latissimus dorsi a bit. But if you don't see it here, your textbook has wonderful illustrations of all of the muscle groupings. So make sure you take the time to look at the various diagrams that are in the text so you can have an idea why those muscles are named according to what they are and how they are named uh, according to their shapes and their actions. Sometimes latissimus dorsi is referred to the, as the muscle that creates the wings of the back because when it's actually flexed, it literally looks like the sides of the muscle span out like wings. That's a muscle that's pretty prominent in a lot of swimmers, particularly if they are um, swimmers that do the butterfly stroke that requires the entire arm to rotate in order to propel them forward. Deltoid is the muscle of the shoulder. It's kind of an inverted triangle, if you could kind of think of it like, kind of like that. It's located in the shoulder. And then you have three muscles, and there you should actually include one more. Let's see. We have subscapularis, infraspinatus, and supraspinatus. Hmm. That's actually all of them. That's all you need. These are muscles that you will find on the scapula, which is the shoulder blade. Now, it looks like they are indicating that they are somewhere near the spine, but it's not actually talking about the spine itself as we know it. It's referencing the spine of the scapula. If you can imagine, this would be a right scapula, okay? And I know it just looks like a triangle, but you understand that, that the scapula kind of looks like a triangle. Well, in the center of the scapula, let's see, yeah, we have a prominent ridge. And in persons who are malnourished, you can come sometimes see that ridge from the rear. Well, this is referred to as the spine of the scapula. So where we see the term supraspinatus and infraspinatus, we're talking about where the muscle is located in correlation to the spine of the scapula. So infraspinatus is located below it, and supraspinatus is located above the spine of the scapula.
So then you might be asking, well, where is subscapularis? Sub meaning below. If I were able to take this out of the plane of my whiteboard and turn it around and show it to you in this fashion, that's where we would see subscapularis being beneath the scapula. Okay, so all of those are muscles that move the arm. But what you will note, and this is true of many muscles, and it's also kind of worded, uh, it's on your study sheet as well, is that the muscles actually that move a particular area precede the region that they're moving. So we're talking about moving the entire arm, but notice most of those muscles are located in the shoulder or in the region of our shoulders. Just as the next group of muscles are responsible for moving our forearm, but they're all located in our upper arm. So the muscles that move the forearm include biceps breaking, Name accord, named according to the divisions of attachment, brachialis, brachioradialis, named according to its origin and insertion or location more so because brachial means arm, but it's telling you that it actually inserts at the radial portion. So remember from the skeletal system, the radius was the lateral bone of the forearm. And then we have triceps, triceps being named according to the divisions of attachment. Now, obviously, all of those muscles are responsible for helping to move this portion, the forearm, but they're all located in the upper arm. The next grouping of muscles help us to move our hands. And you will notice that all of those muscles are located in our forearm in order to allow our hands to move. We have flexor carpi radialis telling you action and location. It flexes the carpals on the radius side. Just as flexi carpal carpi ulnaris flexes the carpals, which are the wrist, at the ulna side. So those muscles insert here and allow our hands to move in this fashion. And then extensor digitorum. Extensor means to extend or increase the angle. So they help to extend the digits or our fingers. Now I'm using some terminology that you might say, well, wait a minute, I don't know what those words mean. If you go back up to the first page of the sheet that has general information regarding muscles, it talks about all of the different muscle actions, flexion, extension, hyperextension, abduction, adduction, and the list goes on. Make sure that you know that terminology. For example, I'll start with flexion and extension because a lot of times we know what it, the action is, but we don't understand the meaning. Flexion means to reduce the angle. If that doesn't make sense to you, when you think of flexing, this is what you do, right? Well, what did we do? We took our arm from a 180 degree to a 90 degree. Thus the term flex, because we have reduced the angle from 180 to 90. So extension means just the opposite. Excuse my dog if she barks. And in your text, you will actually be able to identify or you should be able to know the definitions for the rest of them. There's only one other that I want to point out. It's not, they're not antonyms, they're not opposites, but it's important to understand rotation and circumduction. To rotate, something has an axis, so it will turn on its axis, meaning it will spin in this fashion, on its axis, like this. While circumduction means to move in a circular path around a fixed point. So the example I like to give is this. The earth rotates on its axis. It takes 24 hours for the earth to rotate on its axis. That's just the earth spinning in its own little circle. But it takes the earth 365 days to circumduct the sun, the sun being that fixed point. Okay, I go back to the muscle groupings because we got all the way to the muscles that move the hand. The muscles that move the abdominal wall, there are four. four. External oblique, obviously, is most superficial. Just one minute, dog's about to bark. 
Okay, we're ready. Okay, so external oblique would obviously be the most superficial. And then if I removed or if I was able to peel back external oblique, it would reveal internal oblique. So it's giving you the indication that externally the fibers are running in a diagonal. If I removed that one, the internal muscles would then also run in a diagonal in the opposite direction. And then if I was able to remove internal oblique, it would reveal transverse abdominis. Thus, the fibers would run in this direction horizontally. And then finally, we have rectus abdominis. Rectus abdominis is what we kind of refer to as that six pack. Everybody's got one. You just might not be able to see it all the time, but those muscles are there. Anytime you see the word rectus, typically it means something that's coming right down the middle. So rectus abdominis, that's those six to eight muscles that you can actually see that are held together by an aponeurosis in between each muscle. Make sure you look at the diagram in the textbook and you can actually see they look like little squares that are being held together by some fibers. The fibers that are holding them together are the aponeurosis. And in between those fibers, and actually I'm gonna do a diagrammatic representation. Let's say this is the standard six pack. In between each muscle, you have the aponeurosis kind of holding each one to the other. But then down the middle, you have connective tissue. The name of this is linea alba. And I'm just gonna check to see if that's on your study sheet. Um, it's not labeled, but you can kind of, you can definitely see it and it's in between each of the little squares or rectus abdominis. So that's a really good picture on the study sheet to give you an idea of where those muscles are located. Okay. So now we skip right down to the muscles that move the thigh and there's some information that you need to know about so it's major. There's a major, there's also a minor. Typically, we do not actually see psoas major because psoas major is located on the back of the abdominal cavity. And it's all the, its origin is up near the 11th and 12th rib. And it's a quadrilateral muscle. But in cases that have been autopsy, we need to use that particular muscle as a reference to help us locate the vascular system that's deep to it. Um, in cases of autopsy, obviously, the abdominal and the pelvic cavity have been eviscerated, meaning all of the organs have been taken out. And it's our job to make sure that we locate a vessel because we know that it's arterials, our arterial system and our venous system that is responsible for helping with the distribution of the fluid. But formalin is the solution in which the formaldehyde gas is emitted. So we rely on our vascular system to help to distribute the gas through the tissues in order to fixate them. Now you might think, well, how does that happen? Well, when we get to the circulatory system, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But what I will tell you is that we need that, that fluid to get all the way down to the capillaries because capillaries are so very small and so very thin that they have that they can have gases pass directly through the walls of the vessel. So that's where the formaldehyde is actually released. But if I don't raise an artery in order to inject my formalin solution, then that gas can never actually permeate the tissues because it hasn't gotten to the capillaries. So for that reason, I still need to raise a vessel. Psoas major will help us locate the external iliac artery. The external iliac artery will continue to travel inferiorly and become the femoral artery. The femoral artery will then continue to travel and it will become the popliteal artery. And then it will bifurcate, meaning split. It will then become the anterior and posterior tibial, the fibula. So what happens, our circulatory system is a closed system. So 
as it passes beyond different anatomical structures, then the name of the vessel changes. But I'm saying all of this because without raising that vessel behind that's deep to psoas major, then I can't get the fluid to get to reach the capillaries. And that's the only way that the gas can be emitted. Now, if I don't have an autopsy case, there's no need for me to worry about it because hopefully the vascular system has not been compromised and my fluid will be able to flow through the arterial system, through the vascular system, and then back out and drain through the vein. So hopefully that will happen. Okay, so we have psoas major, and there's a little bit of information in regard to psoas major on the study sheet. I've already talked about gluteus maximus and the fact that there is a gluteus minimus, gluteus maximus being the largest and strongest muscle in the body. And then we also have adductor brevis, longus, and magnus, all named according to the actions that they perform. They also help to uh, make up what's called the femoral triangle. The femoral triangle are, is three muscles that help to border the region, it kind of makes a triangle, that's the name, where we would actually be able to make an incision and raise the femoral artery. All right, and then finally in, the la in that group of muscles that move the thigh, and when we think about muscles that are moving the thigh, they're moving the entire leg or the entire thigh, not just the lower leg and not just the foot, but just like when we talked about the muscles that move the arm, the muscles that move the thigh will help to move the entire leg. Gracilis is also a muscle uh, that helps to move the thigh. Its origin is way up on the pelvic bone, and it's the most medial muscle of the thigh. Now, the interesting thing about this muscle, you don't think it really does a whole lot, but if you've ever ridden a horse for a particular time, this muscle stays contracted all the time to keep you on the horse. That's why a couple of days after you've ridden the horse, or if you've ridden anything that requires you to be straddled and hold yourself in place, that particular muscle will ache. Okay, um, let's see. Now we have the muscles that move the lower leg. So these low muscles are located in our thigh and on the back side of the thigh. We have the hamstring group and the quadricep group. Quadriceps, there are four muscles that are located on the front of the thigh. Hamstrings, there are three muscles that are located on the back of the thigh. Make sure that you know which group, which muscles belong to which group. Okay, so for the hamstring group, we have biceps femoris telling you location and divisions of attachment. Two divisions of attachment located on the femur. Semitendinosus and semimembranosus, just make sure that you know that they're part of the hamstring group and they're part of the muscles that help to move the lower leg. Then we have sartorius. Sartorius is actually not a part of the hamstring or the quadricep group, but it is an S-shaped muscle that has an origin on the lateral side of our hip and it inserts on the medial side of the knee. Now the quadricep group. I like to call the quadricep group my um, chicken drumstick group. And I'm going to tell you why. Because it has three muscles that have the same first name. Vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius. And then we have one that's named rectus femoris. Now remember I said rectus kind of comes down and it's in the middle. All that. Okay, this is why I call it my chicken drumstick. Okay, that's my best diagrammatic representation of a chip, chicken drumstick. And let's just say this happens to be a right chicken drumstick. Now, if you've ever eaten chicken, some of you may have, some of you may not have, or you might, or you might not. But <clears throat> when you take that first bite of the drumstick, typically, if you do it just right, there's a big chunk that comes off, like a teardrop, okay? Just keep that in mind. And when that big teardrop chunk comes off, this is what you're left with. I'm getting rid of the teardrop. On the bone, there's this little piece of meat. 
that's still there once you take that big chunk off. But then you have meat on this side and you have meat on this side. Now, this is how we couple it back and we kind of think about our muscle groupings. Okay. If this is a right drumstick, then this would be the lateral side. This would be the medial side. Well, remember, we have three muscles that have the same first name, vastus, vastus, vastus. If I can remember that this is the lateral side, then this would be the equivalent of vastus lateralis. This would be the equivalent of vastus medialis because there's still meat on this side of the bone and there's meat on this side of the bone. And in between the two is that little bit of meat that's sticking to the bone. Well, that would be the intermediate, what's in between the two, vastus intermedius. But don't forget, there was that big chunk that you took off beforehand that was referred to as rectus femoris. So that's why I like to equate it to that because I can visualize, I think of, you know, I use food a lot in this class as far as my comparisons because it's something that we all have to partake in. You eat something. So why not help it help you understand anatomy? So there we go again. Right chicken drumstick, but we're using it for the muscles of the quadriceps. So this would be vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, vastus intermedius, and the dotted line would represent rectus femoris. All right. So next, we have the muscles that move the foot. And obviously, the muscles that move the foot are located in the lower leg. Many of them are named according to the bone that they're near and the action they perform or where they are located. Tibialis anterior, it's on the front of the tibia. Uh, let's see, tibialis posterior, so on the back of the tibia. The tibia is the shin bone. Fibularis longus, it's uh, a long muscle that's on the fibula. Those are the easy ones. Plantaris, now plantaris is not in your textbook, but it's a very small muscle that's located behind the knee, and it has a very, very long, thin tendon that attaches to it. Remember, and I don't believe I said this, I said it in chapter, uh, the chapter about the skeletal system, but don't forget it. Tendons attach muscle to bone, ligaments attach bone to bone, and an aponeurosis will attach muscle to muscle. Well, let's talk about gastrocnemius. Gastrocnemius is the muscle that's in our calf. And even though it doesn't say that it has more than one division of attachment, it does. It actually has two divisions of attachment. It has a medial head and it has a lateral head. But more importantly, it has a very important tendon that attaches to it. We refer to it as our Achilles tendon, but it can also be referred to as the calcaneal tendon because it attaches to calcaneus, which is our heel bone. And then finally, we have soleus. Soleus is a muscle, and you can kind of see it, you can see it on the the study sheet, it kind of looks like a feather, but the only way you can see it is if you remove gastrocnemius, you'll actually see that fan-like, not fan-like, feather-like muscle that's beneath it. Feather-like, leaf-like, same thing, but it looks like this. Okay. Well, that concludes your lecture on muscles. Make sure you use all of the resources that I've suggested in um, preparation for your quiz. As indicated, you will have one diagram. That diagram will be on muscles of facial expression, and the rest of it will be the standard multiple choice questions that you normally have on quizzes. Have a wonderful day.